Hello, and thank you for tuning into From God's Heart with your host, Ann Thomas of Ann Thomas Ministry. Great morning, friends. I pray that you had an awesome week. Hey, my week was good. A challenging one, but it was good. Um, it was challenging because my faith was truly tested just this week. I mean, but why shouldn't it be, right? Because here I am encouraging you to live by faith. And God says, hey, girly, you know, are you walking that talk? Here's what I learned this week. Fear, the flesh, and faith cannot coexist. Did you get that? Fear, flesh, faith, not a good combination. I had a situation happen and I immediately resorted to my feelings, which the Holy Spirit later showed me was rooted in fear. Well, let me kind of back up a little bit and be a little more specific. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm led to share with you this morning. So if I run out of time before covering all of the content that I had planned to talk to you about, we'll just pick it up next week. So I'm dealing with a situation that basically I told the Holy Spirit that I would take my hands off and trust that by faith that he can do a better job than me. And we all know that he can. Now, as a mom, there are times when, though I don't like it, I have to bring correction. And sometimes my sons respond with compliance. Now compliance is just simply doing what you're told to do, even though you don't like it and you don't agree. Now the Holy Spirit showed me that conviction is more powerful than compliance. That conviction brings about a true change of heart and conviction is his job. So I said, okay, yes, sir. You're in control and I'll keep my hands off. And for the record, my desire to control friends is simply out of wanting the best for my son. I want him to step into all God has for him. But I've got to remember that God created him and loves him way more than I ever can. So God, in all of his sovereignty, he knew that I had not truly, 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 truly surrendered it to him, though I truly thought I did. So God tested me. Now God tests and the devil tempts. There's a difference. A test comes to show us those areas where we're still in need of total reliance upon God. Whereas a temptation comes to pull us out of the will of God and cause us to rely upon what our flesh wants rather than what God wants. And when God sends a test, the devil likes to butt his nose in and attach a temptation to it. And for me, the temptation was to get all emotional so I could respond in fear and try to regain control. The devil is sneaky, y'all. So along came the test and also the temptation. And let's just say that this girl didn't start out on the best note. I'm just being honest. Is that okay? I'm hoping that my honesty will help someone this morning. So my initial response was emotional. It was full of fear. And then when the smoke cleared, all I could do was head into my bedroom, hit the floor. I got on my face and I cried out to God. And what do you think God reminded me of while I was soaking the carpet with tears? Yep, he said, hey, I thought you were going to trust me and not try to control the situation. So he was right. I repented for my doubt. I released the fear to God and gave him the reins all over again. And friends, can I tell you that the minute that I released the situation to God, the Holy Spirit began to show me that he was already at work. But I had missed what he was doing because I was blinded by the fear. See, we're not called to live by fear. Hebrews 10.8 says that we are the just and the just shall live by faith. Living by faith is when we allow God to add his super to our natural, which then empowers us to live above our circumstances and not beneath them. Okay, so I think I've said enough on that topic. And I pray that if you're listening this morning and you're currently in a struggle and you are tempted to take back something you've already released to God, I encourage you to leave it in his hands. Keep trusting him, friend. He is faithful. Amen. Before I get into the teaching, I do want to say thank you to you, my listeners. I appreciate your comments on the discussion board, your texts, your Facebook messages, and your emails. I also want to thank some special ladies who consistently cover me, this show, 
the listeners and my ministry in prayer. God bless you ladies and God will reward your faithfulness. Before we move on, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you right now for each and every listener. Thank you for their hearts of expectancy this morning. May each one hear a personal and direct word from your heart today. May they enter into this day with a boldness, knowing that by faith there is nothing they cannot conquer. May they hear only your words, Father, and not mine. Less of me and more of you. None of me and all of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Friends, wherever you find a victory in the Bible, you also find a man or woman who exercise faith. Our victory is in our faith. And the enemy wants to steal our victory by attacking our faith. So today, we're going to discuss three tactics used by the enemy to steal our victory and weaken our faith. The first attack on our faith is through fear. Now, in my own personal example, I spoke about operating in fear, but I also want to talk about another person who operated in both faith and fear. I want to talk about Peter. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14, or you can simply listen. Now, let me give you a brief synopsis of what happened prior to where we're going to start reading. Jesus just got through feeding 5,000 people. And he wants to go to the mountain by himself to pray. So he tells the disciple to get into a boat and go to the other side. And they did. Now, while they were out on the boat, way out in the deep, a little before dawn, Jesus decides to go out to them, not in a, another boat, but walking on water. And when they saw him, they all became gripped with fear because they thought he was a ghost. But then Jesus identifies himself in verse 27, and that's where we're going to pick up. I'm reading from the New King James translation. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter operated in both faith and fear. He began in faith, but he ended in fear. He told Jesus, if it's truly you, Lord, tell me to come. And by faith. He stepped out onto the water and verse 29 says he actually walked on water. So he didn't sink the minute he stepped out of the boat, right? But what happened? Well, the test came and Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the waves that were crashing around him. He looked at the storm. Now realize that Jesus didn't say to him, Peter, you have no faith. He said what? He said, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, remember my situation that I shared at the beginning of the broadcast. I did a Peter. I had just enough faith to step out of the boat and give it to God. But when the waves of the unexpected circumstance came crashing around my feet, I panicked and I took my eyes off of Jesus, who is the author and finisher of my faith. So friends, what about you? You have a situation where you said, I'll trust you, God. But when you woke up the next day, the next week, the pain is still there. The check hasn't arrived. The bills are still unpaid. Your spouse still wants a divorce. Your kid is still rebellious. Are you gripped with fear? And are you tempted to take matters into your own hands? Friends, fear is not of the Lord. And 1 John 4, 18 says that perfect love casts out fear. You see, when we understand that God's love is unconditional and it lacks nothing, we will then realize that he will not allow us to be defeated. He created us for victory. Why? Because victory draws others to him. Second Corinthians 2.14 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Our procession of triumph or victory 
spreads the knowledge of Jesus everywhere we go. Knowledge of his salvation, forgiveness, freedom, healing, and his power. Well, no wonder the devil wants to hinder our faith and steal our victory because, friends, it's not just about us. I want you to think about a couple of things when it comes to the enemy stealing our victory. First and foremost, Peter had just witnessed one of the greatest miracles ever prior to getting into the boat. He saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Now you might say, how can Peter witness such an amazing miracle and then hours later doubt Jesus' power? Well, the same can be said for you and me. How can we experience God's faithfulness on one hand and then wonder, will he do it again the next time? Friends, we have an adversary, and his entire goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal our faith, kill our hope, and destroy our destiny. Now, remember I said, it's not about us, because there were other disciples in that boat who didn't even think about leaving that boat. They didn't even think about stepping out. They were like, uh, Peter, dude, you are crazy. But yet they all watched Peter walk on water. And that resulted in the rest of them praising Jesus and what they witnessed added to their faith. Remember the triumphant procession, the parade, the more we march around and boldly proclaim the fragrance or the good news of Jesus everywhere, the more others are drawn to him. People are drawn to Jesus because of your faith, because they realize that what you are believing for and what you are expecting is bigger and greater than you. Amen? Well, friends, there is a cute little woman in Hernando County who right about now is not going to be happy because I've got to stop here. I'm out of time. But next week, we'll discuss the other two tactics of the enemy to steal our victory and weaken our faith. My friend, Christ can't lead you in a triumphant procession if you don't have a personal relationship with him. But you can enter into that relationship with him right now by saying this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe you died and rose for me. I'm in need of forgiveness and I thank you for forgiving me. And as you forgive me, help me to forgive those who've hurt me. Help me to develop an intimate relationship with you through prayer and reading your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Now, if you said that prayer with me, please send an email to email at anthomasministry.com. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to pray with you. If you enjoyed this broadcast or if you'd like to share your thoughts, please scroll to the bottom of my program page on the WTIS website and leave a comment on the discussion board. Until next time, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear because God is with you and he will not fail you. Thank you for tuning in to From God's Heart. If you are blessed by the message or anything shared today, please consider being a ministry partner through your prayers and financial support by visiting anthomasministry.com and click partner with us. Our financial partners keep this program on the air, help us minister to the lost and encourage, equip, and empower believers. And as you sow into the lives of others, you can expect God to not only meet your needs, but to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or imagine. Until next time, may the blessings of the Lord make you rich and add no sorrow.